right, welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight, our guest is Dawn Eden. Been on the network uh, many times on Life on the Rock before, and she's written a new book, My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints. So tonight's show is about a mature uh, material, so it uh, might, might, might not be appropriate for our, our younger viewers, but I'm very happy to have her here, and she's got a, a lot to say, so we're gonna mm. go deep into that tonight. Good to see you, Doug. You too, Padre. How you been? Very good, how about you? Good. 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 I found some good quotes here, I think, that relate to the show uh, tonight. And this is from UCAT, and they have some very poetic stuff in this. And this is one of my favorite quotes in the UCAT um, Catechism. It says, God often leads souls to himself along unusual paths, a lack, a loss, or a wound, if accepted and affirmed, can become a springboard for throwing oneself into the arms of God. The God who brings good out of everything and whose greatness can be discovered in redemption even more than in creation. Isn't that powerful? He said, whose greatness can be discovered in redemption even more than in creation. Meaning, and the, the work of redemption that Jesus Christ has done for us. And we're going to talk about that on the show tonight that, you know, we can all have wounds from our sins or sins of others. And we bring them to Christ and can receive healing and he can bring us to a holiness in him. It's all through a, a union with him, through the Holy Spirit. And uh, because we can become discouraged, can't we, with the mm. challenges in our own life and maybe the people around us? Right, yeah, there's no question about it. And you know, the, the great mission of our Lord when he came into this world assuming human nature um, was to redeem, was to heal. And you know, there's something, the, the, the mystery behind that is something that's a life long journey to more deeply understand. But, you know, when you think of our Lord's suffering and his agony in the garden, and you think of the sweating of blood, actual, you know, sweat falling to the ground like drops of blood, as it says in the Gospel of John, there's something about him reaching this depth of, 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 of despair and, and dismay and disorder and chaos and wound and all that we would go through and have gone through, that he would go there to share that with us. Mm -hmm. There's something that's so powerful, so beautiful, and so loving about that when he didn't necessarily have to. If you right, know. right. You know, the choice, you know, your will be done, not mine. I yeah. will do this. I will go to this place and I will show them that I love them. Right. And it is, it is incredibly powerful. Um, it, it's, you know, I think it's Fulton Sheen, Archbishop Venerable, Archbishop Fulton Sheen saying that, you know, the passion of Christ, the suffering, the wounds of Christ is like this beautiful painting. Every time we look at it more deeply, we see a, a brush stroke so perfectly placed that it just deepens that mystery and that understanding of his redemption and his healing power. Right. It's, it's incredible. A, it's such a fullness, a fullness to it that yeah. we can just see pieces of it. Right. But those pieces are so powerful. And it, the catechism goes on to say, it says, holiness, however, is not some sort of self-made perfection. Rather, it is union with the incarnate love that is Christ. Anyone who gains new life in this way finds himself and becomes holy. We're going to talk about that tonight, that mm -hmm. it's not us getting better or us improving ourselves and then we have a relationship with Christ. No, it's being joined to Him, it says, uh, is through the, that union with the incarnate love that is Christ, right, that makes us holy. So that means bringing ourselves truly to mm -hmm. Him and we can do that as Catholics in such an extraordinary way through the sacraments, uh, through the scriptures, the Word of God, as Pope Francis reminded us in Brazil, through service, you know, service of the marginalized, the weak, the lesser. Uh, we encounter Jesus in a powerful way there. And those are, are ways that make us holy, perfect us, and we find a, a new fullness that we were, we were made for. All right. There's so much, you know, in, in the Gospels and so much in the lives of the saints, and even Pope Francis and some of his recent writings, such, such as when we were back at World Youth Day in Rio, that emphasize so much about the need for us to come out of ourselves and really reach out to others and really, you know, take the church to the streets or or, um, you know, that, that culture of encounter that the Holy Father, Pope Francis, mm -hmm. spoke so much about, uh, to encounter others in their wounds, in their suffering, to help with that healing, to be an instrument of God's grace to help with that healing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we all have that opportunity. Everybody runs into somebody every day, practically, you know, that has something that they're struggling with, dealing with. And you think about how many people we meet, we don't even know what they're struggling with, but they are. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, you could be walking cashier at the grocery store, and, I never forget the time I, I just said to someone, I try to make a habit to try to say, hi, how you doing? What do you think of your job? You know, just a little small talk at mm -hmm. least. Look at them in the eyes and let them know that they're important by a little conversation. Bless Mother Teresa was really big on that. And uh, never forget the conversation I got into with a lady and she very quickly opened up and talked about her son who was in the Middle East 
at that point, and, and her daughter who was away at college, and her, her concern, her fear, her worry for them under their circumstances. And just very quickly, we're able to, to, to find some sort of uh, brother sisterhood, if you will, by simply saying, you know, what are their names? Just give me their first names. I'll pray for them. I'll say a prayer for them. And her face lighting up, mm -hmm. you know, that she's dealing with this struggle, this, 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 um, this difficulty at the time of, of, uh, of loss and worry, anxiety for her loved ones. And just a complete stranger talks right. about praying right. for them. Right. We can do this. Yeah. We can do this so easily with so many people if we just come out of ourselves and be part of that culture of encounter. And I, I think that, yeah, I think that's, as you mentioned, that's Pope Francis is one of aspect of his message about going out. And, you know, sometimes we can think, well, it means preaching on the street corner, right. but more than likely, you know, the, the occasions that come to us are these people we meet, sure. airplanes, yeah. checkout counters, yeah. whatever, so. Yeah, oh yeah, airports, airplanes, oh yeah. <laughs> you a lot know of that, people, right? A lot of people there <laughs> right, right. that, you know, need prayer. Well, we're going to take a quick break. <laughs> I, say that, I say that respectfully. I don't mean that rudely, but yeah, myself included. <laughs> well, uh, good, good thoughts, Doug. And we'll, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in a minute with Don Eden, so don't go away. Hi, welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guest is Don Eden. Welcome, Don. Thank you so much. It's great to be on. Good, Good to have you, have you back Thank on the you. show. It's been a while, and um, we brought out the old chairs for you just to make <laughs> you feel uh, feel at home when you're on before. I do. I feel very comfortable. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, you've written a new book, uh, My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints. And um, good book. I've been working my way through it. And um, let's start, I wanted to begin this just by talking about the core of your message, because so many people out there have suffered this, one in four women, I think one in six men. Um, what is the core of your message? Well, the core of the message is, is a message for people who, like myself, bear the wounds of childhood sexual abuse or any kind of childhood trauma. I, I'm a convert to the Catholic faith, and I went for uh, so many years uh, thinking that um, my wounds somehow separated me from Christ, somehow prevented me from receiving uh, the love of Christ. And what I've learned through studying the faith, through living life on the rock, mm -hmm. in, the, in the sacraments, <laughs> and through the lives of saints, including saints who suffer childhood sexual abuse, I've, I've learned that that our wounds do not separate us from Christ. Like you were saying, mm -hmm. reading from the UCAT uh, earlier, uh, the message about how it's through a lack, through a, a wound, uh, that, that God can reach us. And he, and he does. Our Lord himself is wounded. He has chosen to retain his wounds in heaven, and his wounds are now glorified. So when I unite my own wounded heart to the wounded and glorified sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, then my own wounds become the cracks that his light can get in. So it's not in spite of our wounds that God's love mm -hmm. reaches us, it's through our wounds. And that's mm -hmm. the message of my book, My Peace I Give You. Right, and you know, when you say that, I think of, you talk about it very poignantly in the book uh, about the suffering of the post-traumatic stress disorder, the depression, the anxiety, how that severely affected your life, affected your academic life you were sharing with me. And for you to say that is not just me saying that or a preacher saying that. From you, you've walked through a lot in your healing and recovery involving all kinds of, you did a lot of therapy on a natural level, uh, involved a conversion to Christianity. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you've had quite a journey. And uh, so you, you mentioned the book about the Anima Christi prayer and you opened the book, I think, with that, about um, that, that phrase in there that struck you 
uh, hide me in the wounds of Christ? And, yes, yeah. the Anima Christi prayer is one of the first prayers that I learned as a Catholic. I believe I learned it from a book that uh, Amy Wellborn sent me. I was a blogger at the time that I, uh, that I entered into full communion with the, with the church. I'd been briefly uh, a Protestant for a few years, then became Catholic. And when I discovered this Anima Christi prayer, which was a great favorite of St. Ignatius of Loyola, I saw that, that it says, soul of Christ, sanctify me. You're speaking to Christ on the cross. And then it has this wonderful line, within thy wounds hide me, never permit me to be separated from thee. And that opened up a new avenue of contemplation for me because I thought, what does it mean to be hidden in the wounds of Christ? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that all through my life, even during the darkest parts of my life, in my own darkness, I have yet been surrounded with His love, His embrace, His light, and that that embrace was there even when I didn't know it. And now I am a member of Him through my baptism, and that light will be with me always, no matter what darkness may come, no matter what bad memories may come, His love and His grace is greater than all the evil I've ever suffered and all the evil uh, that I've ever committed and, and of which I repent. And maybe tell us, what does it look like practically? Because um, a lot of us, you know, we know the faith, we know Jesus loves us, we know He forgives us. But it's hard for us to experience it or to get it at the level of the heart, to have that kind of heart experiential knowledge of it. How did you get there with that? Well, certainly living life in the sacraments was mm -hmm. very important. I remember after after becoming Catholic, entering the church, I was working at that time for the New York Daily News. I had to work on Sundays. And I remember one Sunday, I just didn't have it together. I didn't go to, to a vigil mass. I didn't make it to Sunday mass. And I had read my catechism, so I knew, okay, I've got to go to confession and, and confess this. And I, and I confessed it, and, and I, uh, and I remember having this sense in confessing it that, that I really did something wrong. I really broke a commandment, and that breaking the commandment was a willful separation uh, from, uh, f from God. And this, it's like Fulton Sheen says when he speaks about, about sin, as he uses this image of there being a, a glass between me and God where the light is supposed to shine through. Our sin fogs up the glass. So when I confessed that, that sin, I, I resolved never to miss a Sunday Mass after that. And, and that helped me to understand that living life in the sacraments through through mass through through confession uh, through prayer that this is part of letting god's grace work on me and 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 heal me and then the greater healing came as i studied what the faith teaches about suffering about uniting our own sufferings to christ's passion and when i learned the stories of saints who had suffered wounds like my own that's when the healing really went into overdrive now that is interesting because when I was reading the book, you just have brief uh, summaries of the s lives of the saints, of some of the saints you selected. And I was, I was surprised how moving it was because most of them I'd heard these stories before. But it, it reminded me that uh, how we really need to go back to the saints and there's something there that we just don't get from abstract reading about the faith or reading the catechism or something. There's something about the witness of their lives that touch us in a way that motivates us that, that we, need. we need. We need witnesses. We need more than just teaching, right? We need witnesses, people that have done it before us. You, Mark, you, I mean, you remark about how uh, some of the virgin martyrs, right, suffered this abuse. And talk about that, how uh, when you read their lives, how that, how that spoke to you. The stories of the Virgin Martyrs are, are very important and very widely 
misunderstood. When I first came to the Catholic faith, I learned about uh, St. Maria Goretti, who's a modern day martyr of, of chastity, uh, who died uh, of wounds inflicted by, uh, by a, a, an attacker who, uh, who inflicted these wounds on her because she resisted his effort uh, to rape her. And so often when her story is told, it's told uh, in such a way as to imply that Maria Goretti died physically intact, not violated, and therefore she's a saint. And I thought there's something wrong here because not everyone can resist to death. And what does that say for people who have been raped? Does it mean they can't be saints? Of course not. But then I wanted to read, well, what does the church really teach about this? And I went back to uh, Augustine, City of God. In Augustine's time, it was after the Goths had sacked Rome. And many people were saying that Rome had to return to the pagan gods because obviously uh, the Christian God didn't protect Rome. Mm -hmm. And as an example, uh, they said, th these uh, pagans said, well, look, Christian virgins, holy virgins were raped by the Goths, so their God didn't protect them. And Augustine wrote in City of God, what sane person would think that a virgin who is raped therefore loses her virginity? Augustine said that virginity is centered in the will to mm -hmm. remain a virgin and cannot be taken away with rape. St. Thomas Aquinas says the same thing, and he says that uh, if a virgin is raped, even if she should bear a child from that rape, she is still a virgin. So then I studied, well, why is Maria Goretti a saint then? And I learned it's not because she wasn't um, violated, it's because she resisted, and it's because of what that resistance meant. I discovered that there are other modern day virgin martyrs where we don't know, at least in one case, we don't know right. whether she was violated or not. And even if evidence came out today mm -hmm. to show that she was, she would still be right, a saint. Right. And that's so important too for a person's personal healing because uh, you write in the book about how there's uh, people feel guilty, they feel at a fault for this, what happened to them. Could you speak to that issue for maybe people watching? Oh, oh yes. Well, children tend to blame themselves for the evils that other people uh, commit against them. And uh, I myself grew up with this uh, misplaced guilt. So for me, part of my healing was learning that no child is responsible for his or her abuse. The sin is always with the abuser, not on the one abused. Mm -hmm. This is true uh, even of children who are abused by peers. Um, they don't blame, they, they don't show, bear the, the blame mm -hmm. of that. The sin is not on them. And our Lord is very clear about this in the Gospels. When he, when he says, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to him by whom they come. It would be better uh, if, if, if uh, that man had a uh, mm -hmm. millstone around his neck and were thrown into the depths mm -hmm. of the sea um, uh, than, uh, than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Jesus says, woe on the abuser. He never says woe on the abused. In fact, uh, blessed John Paul II pointed out when citing that gospel in his message for the International Year of the Child, uh, John Paul II said that our Lord identifies himself with children. Uh, in other words, whatever is done is to the least of these is done mm. to Christ. Right, and we can certainly see say, Satan's rage at the child, at innocence uh, throughout history. and. Seem like a lot of with the pagan religions and everything, the child is always the first one to suffer. In a secular, atheistic culture, you have abortion, it's always the child that suffers, and uh, you're always in the, the struggle between good and evil. That's right, and we see that struggle now in the effort to deprive children of their right mm -hmm. to have a mother and a father. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 in the um, efforts to normatize uh, same-sex marriage. There's this message that children don't have the right to be born uh, into a family of mm -hmm. natural uh, p parents. Um, children are being treated as objects. Mm -hmm. And 
I know from my own experience that it's that objectification that is very sadly promoted now by our culture mm -hmm. that leads to abuse. So our church, we can lead the way through our stand for marriage because mm -hmm. that's where children are the safest when being, being raised mm -hmm. uh, by a father and a mother who are staying together. Right. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back with uh, Dawn Eden, so don't go away. Welcome back. Tonight our guest is Don Eden. And Doug, you had an interesting question for Don. Well, yeah, Don, you're, you're, you're sitting here, you know, very well spoken, uh, an author. This is your second book or third? Yes, or my second, second. Yes. Um, Yet you suffered the tragedy of some abuse as a child. And I think for a lot of the listeners and viewers, and myself included, um, there's, there's a large space of time there between what, you know, the abuse, and without stirring all that up again, I mean, tra something tragic happened. And now you're able to sit here you know, mentioning God's grace and the saints and so forth, but what were like the hills and the valleys of your life that brought you to this point? I know you could probably talk at length for that, about that, but just kind of a synopsis of giving hope to the viewers and listeners about, um, you know, where do I go? How do I, how do I start to climb out of this, this, uh, this, this bowl that I'm in of, of some sort of despair or, or discouragement? Sure, I'd be very happy to talk about that. I, in my piece, I, I give you, um, I weave my own story with stories of the saints, but try to uh, very quickly fade into the background so that mm -hmm. the saints can speak. But I, I speak a bit about my story, you know, just enough for people to understand that I am one of them. I am right. not writing down to, to, to them. I've been there. So uh, I was born uh, into a Jewish home, uh, the most liberal branch of Judaism, Re Reform Judaism, uh, and my parents split up when I was five. Uh, my uh, sister and I were raised by our mother, and it was just as my parents were separated that I suffered sexual abuse for the first time. I uh, was molested by the janitor at the temple that my family attended. And at first uh, I felt that I couldn't tell uh, my mother. There was all that misplaced guilt, yeah. uh, feeling like there was something wrong going on. The janitor was saying, keep it a secret. Uh, finally, I, t I told my mother. And when I told her, now I'm sure you, 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 you know that um, parents don't, the first thing out of their mouth is not always the right thing. Mm -hmm. It's you know not always the thing that they would have yeah. said yeah. had they had the opportunity to pause. We have we have had to go back once in a while and <laughs> reconsider our words. Um, well, well, my my mother <clears throat> doesn't remember things as exactly as I remember, and I mm -hmm. acknowledge that in the book. My memories are my own. It's very common for people who have memories like mine to not have other people in the family uh, acknowledge mm -hmm. w what they uh, recall happened. Okay. Um, but um, the things that my mother does remember, she regrets. Now what I remember is that after telling my mother uh, what the janitor did, did um, my mother responded, you let him do that to you. Mm. Now I was only five years old, so what I, internalized was, I'm a bad person. Uh, now, later on, uh, the abuse took place at home. Um, my mother uh, had uh, one boyfriend in particular who molested me. Uh, children are more vulnerable in a home where, where uh, the, there is a, a man in the house who is not the child's mm -hmm. father. Um, and, but more than that, my home was what I would call a sexually porous 
uh, environment. Uh, you know, people often, when they think about sexual abuse, they think only about what's called contact sexual abuse. But there's also non-contact sexual abuse. This isn't just a term made up by, um, by religious people to protest against pornography. This is something where experts in the field use that term mm -hmm. to say that uh, for a child to be exposed to pornography is non-contact abuse. Mm -hmm. For a child to be exposed to graphic sex talk, uh, in, or dirty, dirty jokes, any one of these things can uh, have lasting toxic uh, effects, especially when inflicted on a young child. Uh, so uh, when I uh, bec became a teenager and started living uh, on my own, going to New York University, and then as a rock journalist in New York City, I had internalized these lies of my abusers that said that I wasn't valuable for who I was. I was only valuable as an object for what I did. And so uh, I, feeling like I was inside this vulnerable child, created a false self. Uh, this is, I now know, one of the effects of post-traumatic stress. It's important to note that not everyone who has suffered uh, abuse uh, will suffer full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder. Most people will experience one or more effects of post-traumatic stress. In my case, I had this dissociation, creating this false self, so that I was, um, I was being very sexually provocative um, and aggressive because I thought, well, if people are going to use me, particularly men, then I want to at least be in control of how they mm -hmm. use me. I, I desperately wanted to be loved, but I was acting in a way that was not attracting men who were loving. But with your father, they had separated. You were raised, and the situation yes. starts just getting worse and worse. Yes. And you're seeing yourself with less and less value. And your biological father, has, is he involved in your life at all? He remarried. And, you know, in divorced households, uh, there can be a lot of communications problems. Um, my father, um, he certainly now regrets not having asked more questions. Mm -hmm. He did not know what was what was going on. He did not know about the environment. But he, he, the thing is, he didn't really want to know mm -hmm. what was going on in my mother's house. And uh, my mother, for her part, you know, she's watching this. And I know she regrets this. I'm saying this for the benefit of viewers and not to shame my mother who mm -hmm. loves me and who is now, I thank God, supporting me in my apostolate. Um, but at the time, I remember that um, she would triangulate things by, um, by t telling me um, uh, things that my father did that she didn't like. So rather than open up to my father about what was happening in the household, I would um, try to identify with my mother and put my father at, uh, at a distance. And so uh, in answer to your question, that's why my dad um, wasn't more present. It was mm -hmm. both on his side not wanting to be, and then on my side, really um, unwittingly um, sh shutting him out in certain ways. I, I have to get at this only, only because it, it, it's, it's on my heart, men's ministry and working with men and trying to help men understand the need for men to be fighters and protectors and defenders. If anywhere in the course of this, from the time that you were five years old and you brought this up, to your teen years, to your college my years. My dad would have put a stop to it. He says that now. But if a man would have stepped in and just pulled you aside and said, Don, okay, I know things are going bad. I'm fighting for you. I'm going to defend you. I'm going to protect you. Would that have changed your whole outlook on yourself? It, it would have. And, you know, an important message to fathers is that it's never too late to build a relationship with your child. When I was in my mid-20s, my father went into therapy with my stepmother uh, because uh, I, she wanted him to get help to become more emotionally engaged mm. in the lives of people around him. And that was when my father first began to make a real effort to become emotionally engaged in my life and the lives of other people who loved him. And it was really, I can draw a straight line between that and between when I became open to the grace of conversion mm. and when I became uh, open to finding healing from my wounds in Christ. It was when my father started to tell me that he cared about me, started to have phone conversations with me that lasted more than 
five minutes and how are you and what and what grades did you just get in school so uh, I'll, I'll stop pestering you with questions after this but can we reiterate to the audience out there that it's never too late for us men to get involved absolutely to never fight for late. our children yes. I still believe I remember a woman in her 40s whose husband whose father never spent a lot of emotional time with her and she went through several abusive situations as well here she was in her 40s lying in hospital bed with a nervous breakdown and the father came to the room and he had never been very affectionate really at all and never paid that much attention. And he said, is there anything I can do to help you? And she told me, I looked at him and I started to cry and I just said, hold me. Just hold me. Something about the, the strength of, of, of a father, this, uh, yes. the strength of that man in your life, just holding you and feeling that, that, not just the strong arms, but the, but the strong heart behind the arms. Yes, and it's also never too late for a mother to get I involved. Um, uh, my, m my mother and I have, have certainly had our ups and, and downs. Um, and I very recently, I think largely thanks to the prayers of readers of my book, people who hear my talk, we've experienced some healing. And I, I certainly ask the prayers, God, that this continues. It's a two-way two mm -hmm. uh, street. Uh, my heart has to soften. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not just her. Uh, but uh, even you know, the, the healing that's, that's begun just recently has made a great positive difference in my life. So mothers as well. Mm. Let's, let's also talk about how it was connected to the promiscuity, because that's so rampant today, and connected to your ministry today, too, working with uh, prisoners and things. Yes, well, it, it is true. I, I now have been uh, speaking to uh, prisoners and to uh, convicted prostitutes who are in, uh, in, in treatment to, to help them to, to stay uh, off the streets. Um, and I've been speaking about how uh, I used to act out of my pathology through this dissociation, this false self that I had set up, where I thought I was protecting myself by being sexually aggressive, but in fact, I was just attracting uh, predators. And uh, for, for me, um, the healing came with my conversion, which I would also love, love to, uh, to share with you about. Uh, but uh, the, the message that I took from my conversion that enabled the healing was realizing my identity. What I tell uh, these convicted prostitutes, these, pr these prisoners, is that your identity is not in the lies of the person who used you and exploited you and abused you. Your identity is in your being a beloved child of God. Mm -hmm. And when you start to build your identity on that, you learn how to behave in a healthy way. Um, we, we are able to love when we learn how to make ourselves vulnerable in a healthy way. Um, there are healthy ways of being vulnerable. There are unhealthy ways of being vulnerable. And Christ on the cross shows us the, the way. Um, on the one hand, he is vulnerable in that he pours himself out for others. Uh, and on the other hand, it's very interesting when you look at how Christ forgave uh, the uh, people who were crucifying him. He didn't say to the men who were driving the nails in his hands, I forgive you. He said to the, with regard to the people who were actively abusing him, Father, forgive them. Um, and that's very important because I think a lot of people think that forgiving everyone means you have to reconcile with everyone. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is internal. We, com we fulfill the command to forgive when we ask God to forgive that person. Reconciliation is a two-way street and that's dependent on the other person's willingness uh, to reconcile. Mm -hmm. So we can be confident that when we've asked God, asked the Holy Spirit in our hearts to forgive this person, mm -hmm. that we have fulfilled the command whether or not we are able to actively reconcile with that person. And you know, you might not, the person might not be a safe person, so you don't well, have to have the them thing. back in, the, in your life. That, that's the that's thing. Right. And Jesus, even in his vulnerability, did not make himself vul vulnerable to the person who was driving the nails in by saying, yeah. oh, and, and I, and I forg forgive yeah. you. He was vulnerable in a healthy way right. by, by being vulnerable first with, with God mm -hmm. and then with those who were, who were willing to listen to him like, like, the, like the, good, the, mm -hmm. the good thief. Mm -hmm. well, we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back with Dawn Eden. So don't go away, back in a moment.
Hi, welcome back. Um, Don, let's talk about your personal conversion to, uh, from Judaism to Christianity to Catholicism. Well, it began strangely enough with an interview with a rock musician. I was a rock journalist in my 20s and I was uh, throughout this time engaging in the self-destructive behavior that I told you with regard to, uh, to seeking love through what was not love. Uh, and I was also suffering from uh, the effects of what was then undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder. I was seeing a therapist who didn't recognize that my acting out uh, sexually was harmful. He rather encouraged me uh, in, in this as secular therapists may do, particularly mm -hmm. if they're Freudian, um, and not realizing that in fact I was in, in acting out of the abuse, mm -hmm. out of the pathology. And so uh, I was really uh, in this uh, s cyclical, suicidal uh, depression, and I hate to think what might have happened to me if it weren't that one day in my capacity as a rock journalist, I was doing a telephone interview with a member of a band called The Sugar Plastic, not a <laughs> Christian <laughs> rock band, and I thought I would ask him what I thought was a very bright and intellectual uh, question, so I asked him what he was reading. Because he was a bright and intellectual person? Well, <laughs> I wanted affirmation. I was always wanting to, to be valuable for what I did because mm -hmm. I didn't feel valuable for who I was. Mm. So to show how smart mm -hmm. I was, I asked this musician what was he reading lately, and he answered that he was reading a book by an author I had never heard of, G.K. Chesterton, and mm. the novel was called The Man Who Was Thursday. And so I just thought, I'll pick up this book and I'll read it so that I can impress this musician the next time he's in town by saying I read it. Musician from a band called Sugar, Sugar Plastic, Plastic. was reading right. Chesterton. Yes, that's right. <laughs> the God of Surprises. Yeah. Yes, the God, the God of Surprises. <laughs> amen, amen to that. Yeah. So I picked up this novel and I had no idea that Chesterton was this great convert to Christian uh, faith, to, to, or rather to Catholic faith. He was, an, he, he was an Anglican who converted to Catholicism. And as I was reading his book, I got this vision of Christianity that I'd never received before. I had thought, having grown up Jewish and having been used to being other, you know, an outsider, that uh, Christians were like this amorphous, uh, mass of conformist people who ruled the world. Uh, I don't know uh, if, um, if uh, have any of you out, th out there seen Star Trek The Next Generation? Are you familiar with the Borg? Can I see any, any hands? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, the, the Borg <laughs> is this universal uh, mind that controls will, will the planet. Will assimilate you. Yes, yes. yes. You'll become us, will take yes, you over. Yes, yes, they say you will be assimilated. And yes. that's what I thought Christianity was, that it was all just people thinking the same. Uh, and that the only way I could be my own person and have my own identity, which w was what I desperately wanted, was to be different from them. Um, but what Chris, the, the vision of Christianity that Chesterton presented was that the world was already in rebellion. So simple rebellion uh, wasn't creative. Chesterton presented the, the true creative rebellion as being the counterinsurgency, the rebellion for something, for truth and for beauty against a world that's fallen into darkness. You and wanted the deeper so rebellion. The you deeper, be, yeah. the <laughs> deeper re rebellion. And so this introduced to me the idea that my identity, which I so desperately wanted, might be fa found in fighting for the good, the true, the beautiful. And that's what made me begin to realize that that was what Christians were really fighting for. Yeah. And then um, the real moment of grace came after reading a lot of Chesterton over a period of years, I finally started to read what had inspired Chesterton, uh, the, the Psalms, the, the, the Gospels, St. Paul's letters. And one day in October of 1999, I felt moved in my heart to open up the, the letter of the Romans to um, chapter five, verse one. And up until then, I had tried reading uh, the Bible, but I had always felt that the words were just flat words on a page. It would be nice if they were true, but I couldn't really um, connect with them. 
But when I felt moved in my heart to read Romans 5.1, I opened it up and I saw, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And suddenly, you know, it's like the movies where everything goes from being black and white into technicolor and the words just seem to jump off the page and become three dimensional. And it was no longer just some person writing 2000 years ago. It was the voice of a living person, the Holy Spirit. Say the quote again. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I felt the voice of the Holy Spirit just speaking to me and wanting to be in communion uh, with me. And I began to feel that peace of Christ or the leading edge of that peace of Christ. And I wanted that peace and I chased that peace. I first chased it into baptism. I chased it down uh, the wrong corner (laughs) and got (laughs) baptized in a a Protestant church. But thank God after after five years as as a Protestant, and really having you know taken in for a while these ideas that 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 oh, you know because Jesus is everywhere, you don't have to be mm-hmm. Catholic. Well, yes, Jesus is everywhere, but only in the church he founded on earth is his real presence. And you know if you want to be a member of the mystical body, you want to be where the heart is mm. and the the church is is wh- is wh- where um, we we ha- we have uh, the uh, the the living fullness. vital center mm. and the fullness mm. uh, of, uh, 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 of of our lord jesus christ and of his grace uh, so thank god um, april 2006 uh, i was received into into the church and and that's where I began to really find uh, the peace of Christ that I share in, in my mm-hmm. book, My Peace I Give You. Right. I wanted to, we can't let the show end without talking about St. Paquita. Um, powerful story, a woman, a slave from the Sudan who got uh, horribly abused in her life. And the thing that touched me so much in the book was that, you know, she's a saint, she achieved this incredible holiness, and she struggled her whole life. Even on her deathbed, she was having flashbacks to her mistreatment as a slave. And I thought that was so powerful because sometimes we think, well, holiness means we're gonna overcome all this stuff and uh, the imperfections or the damage that from this world. Not the case though, so, right? Not the case at all. Uh, in writing my piece, I give you, I found that there were saints like Bikita who suffered flashbacks. There were saints who who suffered other things that, you know, we can't diagnose a saint and say, you know, this saint had such and such a condition, but we can say that they suffered things like uh, what people who have suffered abuse suffer. Mm-hmm. And certainly with uh, Bakita, it was very dramatic. She, what she suffered, um, she had been uh, kidnapped as a child, sold into slavery, was bought and sold, I think, five times by the time uh, she uh, she was in her late teens. You were asking me about whether Bikita was sexually abused. This gets again to the question of how do we define uh, abuse? Mm-hmm. Um, if you define it purely in terms of contact uh, abuse, then no, but if you define it in terms of non-contact abuse, being bought and sold as a slave, she would have been not only treated as an object, she would have been made as a child to stand naked in front of strangers who were looking her up and down, not making eye contact with, with her. Um, and so uh, for anyone who's been treated as an object, uh, mm-hmm. she knows what that's like. And what you were saying about her on her deathbed, um, when she was on her deathbed, she had been a religious sister for more than 50 years, was very far removed from the time of her slavery. And yet she said to the nurse, when she was in her final agony, she said, remove the chains, they are heavy. 
she was flashing back to as a child with the chains, and we know that uh, with the chains on her legs, and we know that Bakita was very uh, closely united with the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, what does this tell those of us who still have physical effects in our bodies from abuse, who still suffer from flashbacks or hypersensitivity? or anxiety, this tells us that Jesus is not removed from us when we suffer these physical effects. His grace is not far from us. His grace is right there with us as we suffer these things and that it actually draws us into a deeper union with his passion. Mm -hmm. that, that is something that gives me great comfort to know. It is. It's very stirring and I would hope it give us all hope uh, to persevere, because right, the, the life, spiritual life takes perseverance, it yes. takes getting up after falls, and the, the saints are great motivators for us in that way. We just have a, a few minutes left. Are there some points you wanted to hit from your book maybe we haven't touched upon? that? Um Certainly. Uh, in my piece I give you, I talk a great deal about healing. People ask me how can you find healing, and I draw upon the spirituality of Pope Benedict, who talks about how memory is not the enemy. There's this great temptation if one has bad memories to just think, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not even going to think about my childhood. Pope Benedict tells us, and he draws from the story A Christmas Carol uh, to talk about this, that the key to healing is not to block out the past, but to find a good memory from the past. Find a time when someone showed you love and to realize from that that God was there with you in the darkness, always loving you. You were always his beloved child, and that same God who was loving you then is loving you still, and he is going to show you how he will bring good out of all your wounds. I, I, I want to you know, speak to, to people out, out there and, and just to, to, say, to say to you that because y you have suffered any kind of, of evil, that makes you uh, that per perfectly uh, equipped to be able to help someone else who has suffered ev evil to find hope in their own life and that that may be something that you may be called to do in your way as God will show you just in your in your everyday life. And that's uh, such a beautiful part of your story. You, know, you mentioned the prison ministry and things and you very much have that on your heart to take that message and work with other people. Um, yes, if there is anyone watching this show who is involved in prison ministry, I've started doing mm -hmm. mission trips, also speaking uh, to people who are in recovery in 12-step uh, programs. I'd also like to speak to Native Americans, to any underserved uh, population. Uh, as long as there are, are people who are willing uh, to just make it possible for me to do these mission trips, I would like to keep uh, doing them. I would like to invite anyone who would be interested in having me, uh, having me uh, do this to visit uh, my blog, The Dawn Patrol, at <laughs> my name, dawneden.blogspot.com. Now, Doug, you have to comment on that. I have that. to comment on that. I'm, I'm wearing my Battle Ready t-shirt, <laughs> and you're talking about the Dawn Patrol. Yeah. I, it's a perfect fit. I mean, this is truly, I, you know, I talk about Battle Ready, which is kind of an effort to try to help people be more aware of the spiritual fight that we're all in. And to be truly Battle Ready means that you are just, you, you, are, you are aware of the situation, the circumstances, and ready to serve and heal and sacrifice and pray for. Um, and I think what you're doing in taking your wounds on your particular battlefield of life and turning it into a search and rescue to go out and help heal others is uh, incredibly noble and honorable. And I just, I, I, I encourage you and pray for you to keep going. Thank you going. so much. It's powerful and it's so needed. Thank you so, so. much. And your, your life too, uh, when you speak about it and write about it, it shows that, that healing takes place very much on a daily uh, lived out ordinary life in many ways. And uh, there is grace throughout. Yeah. Uh, but it's so important to stay in the sacrament, stay close to the sacrament, mm -hmm. stay close to Christ in the Eucharist, to mm -hmm. Christ in the sacrament of reconciliation, to Christ in one another through praying together, through finding friends who support you in your walk. Right. Well, thank you so much for Thank you so us. much. Yeah. Well, may our Heavenly Father shine His face upon us, upon you, and give you His peace, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week.